Luis Torres on the Ben Schneider Show. Luis, great to see you. We finally hit the cycle for our uh, group chat, I guess. You're the last one uh, that I needed to get on the show. But how are you doing, my man? It's good to see you. It's good to see you, too. It's been it's been going all right for the most part. I can't say the same thing about the Seattle Kraken, which whew, they have not been. Let's just say our playoff hopes is dwindling enough to the point where I got to go find stuff to do in April. That's I'll leave it at that. Yeah, well, I know you're a big Seattle sports fan. We'll get into that uh, later on here in the show. Um, the first thing I have to ask you is that we, we've met in person uh, a couple of times, both in Portland and Sonoma, a couple of years ago. I know that uh, your your plans have been a little bit up in the air the last couple of years with your photography and everything. Are you planning on making that trip again this year to those two tracks? Portland is a necessity for the sake of... I was going to do Portland last year, but it just did not work out with the month of May at Indianapolis and just... Everything with NHL playoffs a year ago, it just did not work out last year, which kind of was detrimental in the long haul for me not doing Portland. And as far as Sonoma, it's 50-50, to be honest with you, because as you'll find out, folks, that the journey that I've been has not been all sunshine and rainbows what people think it might look, because it's a long journey. And if I would like to go back to Sonoma, especially with the repave, I'm curious to see how that's going to unfold and just simply to be back because I still consider Sonoma Raceway as my home track. Yes, Portland is much closer. Yes, it's a national touring track, but I still consider Sonoma a very special circuit for me because that was the first NASCAR race I ever attended back in 2013 with my aunt. And obviously what happened in 2013, Pauly Horaka had his moment and Martin Truex Jr. won, which kind of... Started the trend of more often than not, Truex would win or Joseph Newgarden on the IndyCar side. Well, I'm certainly uh, hopeful that we get the opportunity to uh, be together in person again because I am uh, tentatively planning to to do that weekend or set of weekends rather, I guess, with the, the schedules lining up once again this year. So hopefully, uh, I'll see you out there for that. But um, kind of what you were leaning into uh, just now, I want to start with uh, your your journey in racing, and then we'll get into the photography. Uh, side of things in your business there but um you said that that Sonoma race was the first race that you attended in person were you an NASCAR fan before then or was that kind of something that started your uh passion for the sport what was what's the uh story behind your journey into racing Circus City 2002 uh, it was a sample stop at a San Jose Circuit City I saw NASCAR Thunder 2002 it was like the summer or early 2002 give or take it's kind of a blur but i know exactly where it was it was the san jose circuit city which i believe is a, a food chain or something now it's at the in, the in the mall area not in downtown but the one a bit of ways i saw a cover it's like hmm dupont flames 24 car nascar lo and behold just because of the cover it's like we gotta go buy that video game and because Jeff Gordon was on the, on the cover. Then I think it was days later or it was the days before. I, I have to go. I have to remember vividly for a fact. I know for a fact, Circus City 2002, it really kick started it because I saw Jeff Gordon on the cover and it was the first diecast I ever bought. And I still have that 164 scale diecast that I'll probably show off air the how much wear and tear that thing has endured because it was the first die guess I ever had. So not only that, I became a fan of Jeff Gordon and I became a fan of NASCAR since after a while, but first NASCAR race that I saw on TV was Speed Weeks 2003 with the Bush race. A little bit of the Bush race the end at the end of the race. And that's how my mom kind of became a Mike Bliss fan. Yeah, Mike Bliss. 2002 Truck Series champion, he, the Rockwell Automation car. And then the next day was the first cup race I saw, which was the 2003 Daytona 500. You know how that ended up. Newman upside down, Rain Shorten. But to me, what really solidified it for me was the 2003 Carolina Dodge 400. Just the fact that Kurt Busch and Ricky Crane put on that spectacular show at the finish. I had that little Craftsman Media Guidebook. I still haven't. I just don't know where I put it. I'm hoping it's still at the it's still in my room slash office. 
the moment I was like, I was tracking who won the poll, who won every, who won the races by car number, mostly on the Winston Cup side, Bush, trucks, IRL, car, I did not care about all that stuff back then. Especially the truck series when it was, I didn't have Speed Channel till 04. But what solidified for me is that the fact I remember the moment of my choice that Craven got and I instantaneously, instantaneously drove 32 on the winner. And then from that point, it just kind of grew and grew. But it did not attend my first cover race until 2013 at Sonoma. So I've been a longtime fan. I know I have school teachers. You hear stories about back in the day. I think it was one of Brock's videos, like Andy Belmont, where he would draw like 43, the 43 car and all that in his school books and all that. I was kind of that guy, but I was just write about NASCAR, like make my own horrible artworks of race cars. And it just kind of grew and grew. Then the next year after 03 was Formula One, and then the IRL. But before the split, I was more of a champ car guy, mostly because they had racing at San Jose, the infamous San Jose street circuit, where it was they ran pretty much on a train course where you have those all those harrowing bumps on the road, which how uh, nobody got seriously hurt in that matter is beyond me. And yeah, like a simple minor crash for Paul Tracy at Long Beach had ruined his whole season. I love how that that stuff works. That ultimately is what I wanted to do. I wanted to be involved in racing after that in some capacity. And then five years after seeing my first NASCAR race in person, it was my first race I ever covered as a media pundit was at Sonoma. So it always has a special place in my heart, Sonoma. More so that the last NASCAR race I attended as a fan was Tony Stewart's final win. So yeah, I I've, I've it's been quite a quite a journey. There've been times where I had to battle whether or not I want to be passionate about the sport. Especially after Gordon retires from that point on, I really don't have a genuine favorite. Sure, you have a couple drivers that you always want to see do well, you have a soft spot for, but after Gordon, it's kind of that's where I was in college at the University of Idaho which I still firmly believe should still be an FBS school. The fact that they're not is the reason why temporarily and hopefully temporarily they're not in the, they're not in the game. If if NCAA football 25, however they want to call it. So at that point I was just, I had to reduce the fandom a bit. And I learned quite a bit that you can still have genuine favorites. Just try to express it in your own matter. Or you can have a burner account for all I care. Yeah, well, and I certainly understand that feeling. Uh, you know, I, people who, you know, longtime viewers of the channel probably know that I'm, I consider myself a legacy AJ Allmendinger fan. I was a fan of his ever since he, he was, was, was driving the Red Bull car and, uh, you know, failing to qualify for half the season in his rookie year 2007. And then uh, following his journey through kind of breaking through with Richard Petty Motorsports and then getting the big break at Penske before that ended up. Uh, crashing down and everything and then rebuilding his career with JTG and now ultimately uh, with colleagues. So I, I will never root against the guy. I will always be happy when he wins. But now that I'm in the role that I'm in with uh, media myself doing my uh, freelance work with Grid and both last car, both Grid and last car. Info, um, you know, it, I, I try not to express that, you know, bias uh, when I'm when I'm tweeting or, or you know, doing videos like this or anything like that. Um, and I found that, you know, for me, and I think this really showed through uh Formula One, actually, in 2021, um, it is so much more enjoyable and less stressful to watch when you're a neutral fan and you're just there primarily for the racing. And Brock actually mentioned this in just uh, the last episode of this podcast that we did. Um, when you're watching it as a neutral fan, I find that there's, you know, you can follow every story in the field uh, with, with a little more insight because you're not necessarily just focused on one guy or whoever your favorite driver is and uh, really opens your eyes to everything that's going on in the field there. So I actually, I quite enjoy being a neutral fan. Sometimes it's a, it's a lot more enjoyable to watch motorsports. I find than watching like a stick and ball sport where, you know, I, I'm sure you feel this way about the Seattle teams, you know, at any time a Philadelphia team is, is playing, you know, my stress level uh, goes up much more than it would if it's just two other uh, random teams in the league. So I certainly understand that feeling. No, for sure. And with formula one, I did wrote, wrote, wrote about formula one through motorsports Tribune from time to time, mostly like breaking news. 
But of course, when it comes to after a while, I've just not really written about Formula One because I, I want to enjoy the sport on the fan side of things. So, of course, being Hispanic, I have to root for Checo. And good news so far, hopefully I don't jinx him after this recording. He's been, he's two for two in the runner-up spot, which he hadn't had in a while. And I'm just hoping he continues. Like, I've always got a root for him. I've been supporting him since his sour days. His little spiel with Esteban Ocon was questionable, but as far as NASCAR and IndyCar, it's not. It's definitely not easy. But I think when I started writing it in 2017 in the penalty before Jordy Morris' first tribute in 2018, it was good to I learned from guys like Seth Seth Vaggert, who's doing stuff for kicking the tires. And obviously, he's got his own thing going on with all the data and information. Muscle talk to him for sure. Good for, good for him. I always learn a thing or two from him. Also, he's a very go-to guy when it comes to all that kind of stuff, and especially you learn right away when you're in this business. And I think Brock illustrated it perfectly as well. One of his videos where you got to find a good balance or just go go cold turkey about it. Of course. Like I mentioned, you have your feel good stories, you especially with the garage area, especially with Roger Carew fun. That sure. was a big yeah. deal. Uh, and I remember the one interview I did with him was that they told when I was at a crummy hotel where the the clog at the ho at the hotel I was staying for a few days because I was covering New Smyrna initially before doing speed weeks 2021 where i only did the duels in the 500 where i had to only write about it but i did my interview with roger karuf leading up to his arca east debut and i just remember they had this good conversation we had talked about it. Well, that's the thing when it comes to interviews when i do them every now and then where i feel like okay i do have the energy to do it and it's most, it's most i want to bring up like the more human element i always bring up music and i know i think we talked about Oh, I forget what rapper it was. It might have been Ludo, Lil Uzi Vert or something like that for a while. I didn't include it in the story, but in our interview, we talked about it and just want to talk, want to bring some of that element into it. Like, aside from racing, music is my, also my other love, where I'm very critical when number one hits it, but I also have a messy relationship when it comes to my music taste. But yeah, it's, it's easier to watch in neutral. But also, much difficult to harness it when it comes to other sports, especially where I work now. One of my jobs, it feels a little bit more relaxing knowing that I can I could work on it. But also, you, I gotta keep myself harnessed from feeling vocal if the crack can do terrible, or they don't shoot the puck, or they have a collapse, or vice versa, or they're just on a cold streak. But all of us are in it like for the long haul because we want the team to succeed. And as for me, rooting for the Mariners and the Seahawks as well, despite what that had over there in San Francisco, I was a Bay Area kid. Yeah, you mentioned the Seahawks. It's like right in the background, you literally see the 49ers. Yeah. That was because, I forget, I think it was my uncle who bought it one time and I just kept it. Yeah, I even have like Oakland gear stuff. Uh, best believe... I despise the Rams more than the Niners, just to make that very clear. Yeah, well, and I guess if if I had to pick an F1 driver, I mean, I, I feel like I can kind of get away with rooting for Logan Sargent. Obviously, he's at the complete opposite end of the grid in terms of his equipment than uh, Checo Perez is. But, yeah. uh, you know, to Checo's credit, I mean, we'll see. I think this is probably going to go up on Monday, so the day after Australia here. But like you said, he's two for two. And, you know, for all the talk that uh, people were saying about him, you know, last year have, having a down year, being inconsistent, uh, the Red Bull is still so far ahead of the rest of the pack that he still ended up uh, clinching second in points and giving Red Bull their first ever one-two finish. So I, I, I happen to think you know Checo's a serviceable uh, driver, no doubt. Um, you know certainly uh, doesn't have the raw pace that his teammate Max Verstappen does. But then again, you know maybe Lewis Hamilton in the year that the Red Bull and Mercedes were a lot more equal and they had that epic championship battle. But you know there's very few drivers you know in all of history that I think can match Verstappen's pace. So I think it, it's you know not an insult to say that. You know, Checo's just a little bit behind there because, you know, just hardly anybody can match what Max is doing right now. 
No, for sure. Max is in a completely different zip, zip code. In fact, that the only drama he's dealing is just all the stuff off it that has nothing to do with right. him. It's like I said in, a, in one of the podcasts that I do from mo on occasions on Wednesday, depending on my availability, is that it's starting to feel like very like soccer mom, baseball dad energy with Harold and Marco, Jasper Staff, and Christian Horner. Max is just out there just focusing on track and just also do sim work and all that stuff. It's like, I feel, I, I cannot imagine what Max is dealing with. He's probably very good at channeling it off, which is good for him. So far, we haven't really seen a distraction with all that off-track drama, which is good for his part. But no, the, going back with Checo, he's very serviceable. There have been times that have been very vocal. I said, oh, he's the worst number two driver. He's not Heinz Harald Frensen. He's not Gerhard Berg. He's not even Rubens Barrichello or David Coulthard. I've, Especially that downward spiral at the end of the year where he was trying to survive to get second in points. I think I even said he's the Ralph Schumacher. He's he's probably on par with Ralph Schumacher. And that's mostly because I'm vocal and critical. And also just a part of the culture as well sometimes. Like, my family, when it comes to their favorite teams, they'll be vocal. Like, my father, for example. Like, Dodgers, World Series in 2020. Joyful, revered. Two years later, he wants nothing to do with the Dodgers and the fact because they win 100 games a year, except for the one year they did it because of COVID, and that's the one they win the championship. Because he saw it, it's like, what's the point of rooting for them? They're going to always choke in the playoffs because I this was because I wanted him, I wanted to invite him to go see the Mariners face the Dodgers, which obviously the Dodgers were probably going to win that one, but, but he wanted nothing to do with it. And now with the whole thing with Shohei and also the fact that the Dodgers in game number two, here, 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 hear me out on this one. Game number two of 162, they gave up 15 runs already. 2001 Seattle Mariners. I have no way to find out about the Chicago Cubs when they had 160 wins because that also wasn't a 162 game schedule. But here, hear me out. Mar the Seattle Mariners in 2001, they didn't get, they didn't have a game where they allowed 15 runs until game 111 of 162. And the only reason why that happened is because Cleveland just had that big run. That was that big game where the Mariners collapsed horrendously, where people look back it's like if they just sealed the deal in the ninth inning, they would have been 117. You never know with baseball. And obviously, when it comes to baseball, records be be damned because sometimes you can have a low seed make a huge run and then go for the World Series. Like last year, for example, the Diamondbacks. Did anybody really expect the Diamondbacks to be in the World Series? Not me. I thought we were going to be there. And then they beat us. Yeah. And here's the, and here's the thing, speaking of the, not glad you brought up the Phillies. I'm glad I I was bummed out in in a sense well, when we broke the drought and it went to y'all, but I'm glad you only held it for like two days and gave it to Anaheim because nothing makes me happy to see the Anaheim Angels. I still call it Anaheim. I know it's the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim, but I still call them Anaheim because that's how I grew up with that. They have the longest drought and it's still baffling and comedy how you had two generational talents. No World Series appearance, let alone a meaningful playoff run. Bad ownership. But I guess that's the karma they get for beating the Giants in the World Series in 2002. But also, an add insult to injury that Dusty Baker had that one year in 2002 with the Giants, and he got a World Series with the Astros. So it's a love-hate relationship when it comes to baseball. I tell you that much. Yeah, well, and, and I remember Dusty finally getting his as well because that was against the Phillies and. 2022 and that was the one silver lining because uh certainly not a huge astros fan but uh I, I was happy for dusty baker i have to say uh we'll get back into the sports conversation uh later on here in the show but i want to draw it back to uh your career as well um obviously uh your photography business has been a, a huge part of your career i know you also do some writing as well um you you mentioned i think five years after your first race i know that you were you were at haley deegan's first win at meridian right you got some yep. photos there uh, so it was 2018 really the year that things started to take off for you in the photography business? 
Well, first, let me make it clear when it comes to the photography business. The photography business, Luis Torres Multimedia, is more or less local. We're racing. It's not necessarily where I get income because as an editorial photographer, no. Can't earn a dime when it comes to NASCAR and IndyCar stuff. Cannot earn a dime. Cannot. So the the photo business side of things didn't really kick off until years later, but to go back to 2018, I really didn't start doing... Initially, when I joined Motorsports Review, the goal was for me to obviously write, but also do videography. That, that I learned right away that doing videography is very perplex and complicated to where you have to get some licensing agreements and all of that stuff so i had to give up the video bit i still want to do videography real bad to be honest with you but one thing led to another that meridian that night i tried to do some photography i had no idea how to shoot race photography Compared to like the stuff from 2018 till now it's a complete night and day difference in the sense where i actually know how to mess the adjustments properly or reasonable. Back then, I just used auto settings, and obviously, they're not going to turn out well. But that day with Deegan winning, that was a that was a big deal at the time because the, the last time a female driver won a NASCAR sanctioned race, no, a notable one at that was Shauna Robinson. And what here's the thing about Shauna Robinson that they need to put respect on her name, unless your name is Mike Wallace, but everybody else. She put her respect to her name, honestly. Like, I think not many people point out that Haley was the first one since Shauna until I was looking at research, trying to think, when does Shauna, does Shauna ever won a race? And then I realized she won three times for the Goodies Dash series. And, and then also just had, a, if I recall, a successful, tr like, legit, like, semi-truck career. Like, the stuff that you see sometimes at Dover. Yeah, they ran semi-trucks at Dover, because why not? But it was a special day, and I was thinking, this needs to be written right away and published right away. Back then, Motorsports Tribune had, like, about a dozen writers spanning from NASCAR to IndyCar and Formula One. But I had to wait till the next morning just for publication purposes and all of that stuff. But I remember that being a big deal. I remember I tweeted in 2018 when it happened, history has been made. I think Griff was one of the people that said what happened. And I mentioned that Deegan won the race in Meridian after that move with Cole Rouse, which, man, I feel bad for Cole Rouse. The fact that not long after he finally won and when MIA, he was also part of that agency with like James Hinchcliffe and Justin Haley and then nothing came of him. The same can be said about a lot of West Coast drivers in that wow. time period as well. Like uh, Nicole Bihar, Julia Landauer, I'll be as Julia has run some couple national touring events, but he's more known of the stuff outside of racing, but correlating to racing to some extent, if you catch my draft. Sure. Yeah, well, and as, as you mentioned as well, uh, you're you're also a writer, um, and I've seen it firsthand. But just for for the folks at home uh, that they're listening to this, you know how I remember kind of you know being a fish out of water in 2022, having never done the the media credentials thing before, and uh, you know just trying to learn everything on the fly. Um, and I'm and I wasn't doing photography at all. So how do you balance uh, you know what you're doing in terms of getting the photographs you need? Uh, I think you were with the podium finish at the time, um, and also balancing that with you know getting the stories that you need in order to write your articles still with the podium finish but it's a it's a, comp a complicated complex like compared to 2018 for example after meridian because there's no really service over there i had to write the story at a buffalo wild wings in boise not long after and it took me about an hour to put it together, just listening to the quotes and all of that stuff. I had no idea how to do proper photo editing, which is kind of funny because in middle school and high school, I did took photos, but I was more of the hands-on approach, like the content-wise. Not so much in the photography where I had to worry about editing and all of that stuff because I really did not have to worry about it at, that, at the time. As years went on, I definitely realized it is a necessity tool to do photo editing. But and also in a comedian time. 
Like, for example, when it comes to efficiency, my plan is always typically this. When it comes to practice and qualify, I want to make sure I get a photo of every single car on the, that's on the track at all costs. Doesn't have to be clever, doesn't have to be fancy or flashy and all that, but just get like a pretty reasonable photo, a little bit of emotion on the tires so it looks like they're actually running a track. Get all the cars. Because I also do stuff for Vincent when it comes to the West stuff, for example. Like get every car possible. It's just in a timely matter. Then but qualifying's more or less get everybody as soon as possible. Like in any car, I want to make sure I get the photo of the pole winner getting out of the car and all that stuff. NASCAR, I normally I rarely do qualifying photography because that's where I put my writer's cap. This is not the hat that I wear, but it's right next right next to the microphone it kind of shows you my hat collection is all over the place but i put my writer's hat to where it gets some quotes and all of that provide what's needed that for others which is it's one of those deals you know but on the race day itself i always make sure get be at a reasonable area to get the start of the race usually like a wide shot of the green flag or all of that stuff then as the race goes on, get like some action shots, then get creative. But most of my creativity is practice and qualify because at least I can do try to play around with it. But when it comes to the race, I try to keep it relatively minimal unless it's like a long green fly run to where, okay, I can I have time for this. I can do that. But towards the end of the race, I try to be in an area where I can get the finish of the race, but also close to victory lane as as reasonable as possible i refer it as send it home uh, referring to myself like all right time to send them home like send the field home and all of that stuff like the go home spot and all that and, and pro wrestling they like to say the call the go home spot but checker flag is out get them at the line if for an indie car race if it's close to a podium or winner circle be near winner circle like long beach i have to i want to be in winner circle i have to sacrifice the finish but I want to get the celebration instead in a winner's circle. Like Portland, there's an area where you can shoot the like the start finish line or like a wide shot, like on the in uh, past the small media center and all that. Like the so before leaning into turn number one, that chicane, and then after that, try to sprint as fast as possible to get to victory lane, get a reasonable, decent spot. IndyCar can get a little bit more creative. NASCAR just find every suitable spot to shoot and get a, a, the winner in center. Once I get the photos, then I go into writer mode. Because of one outlet, I it takes me much longer than I would like for because I have to literally by hand type in race ro- race results by hand, like on the computer, like in a word a word Excel. One by one, the sponsor, the manufacturer, where they started, the driver's name. It takes way too long for my liking, but that's just part of the part of the mandates of what I do for race week. When it comes to race recast, especially on location, Motorsports Tribune. I didn't have to worry about a lot of years to summarize the race, write about it, see what stands out, get clever about it on certain things that happen, add some quotes wherever it needs to be filled. IndyCar, it's a little bit more challenging because back then. They used to provide a little small quotes of every competitor. That's been long gone since the pandemic happened to where either I have to have time to find somebody to interview that is not on the podium or just focus strictly on the top three finishers and then do a sidebar on one of the top three. The best way to describe it is when Riga Smith at Fontana in like 2019 or 2020 were he ran, I think it was the one where he ran from pit road to get the winner's interview. Right. Yeah. That's the best way to describe it in lamest terms for me. It is not easy. I'll tell you that much. Very few people kind of do double duty, duty like photography and writing. I know Jacob Seelman is one that does it that way. I've been doing it that way. It, it, it's a fun balance, but the goal for me is to someday pick one or the other and earn profit and return on investment because they've been doing it for seven years. And some people say, oh, you get to do all this stuff and all that, but I always get asked every now and then, do I earn a dime? 
I rarely made a dime out of it. It took me a long time to earn a dime in in the racing side of things. And sometimes it's expected or I fall through, I've been low ball a time or two, I've been screwed over, burnt on some deals that and some promises that hasn't happened, it's still ongoing. So sometimes you gotta balance and wonder, is it even worth it? Is it worth doing? More like few years ago, absolutely. But as time goes on, when I have a career to worry about, I have a I have a life to get together, to to get it together, with multiple jobs. And this goes back to my photography business. The reason why I started doing photography business and get paid for it, more or less, festivals, other sporting events like your local stuff, regional stuff, or even portraits and all of that. I hammer it home very hard locally because it is one of my only main incomes. You there's no there's no guarantee, there's no tomorrow you'll be welcome back for an annual event the next year. They may welcome you back the, the following year, but there's no guarantees after that or anything in general. So you always want to do well, keep myself open because I want to do more than just racing on the photography side. I want to do other sports. I want to do other things like portrait photography, modeling photography, but it's not been easy, which is why I keep hammering at home. Like on my photography website, or you, I had a donation section that I had to ultimately get rid of because this has not led to anything for that matter. But there are other ways, like a PayPal or a Cash App, if anybody wanted to support my cost. But the biggest thing is it's not easy. There's been days where it's taxing. There's other things that get in the way that makes the experience annoying. And I'll ride ruin it, which is kind of why, one of the reasons why all of last year, I didn't really do anything West related, except for the finale, because they coincide with championship weekend. Because I needed a break from Arca West. I needed a break on a lot of things because I had to pick and choose which ones I want to pursue and leave that door open. A little bit closed, but not fully closed in case something better comes off it. Yeah, well, I, I certainly understand. Uh, you know, it, it is very difficult to make a dime uh anywhere in this sport, to be quite honest. But uh, you know, there there's there's certainly something to be said for the grind that you know it requires to do those jobs very well, and you do those jobs very well. So uh kudos to you there. Um, one thing that I also know you're very passionate about, and uh, you know, Brock can certainly speak to this, you know, kind of a stat that nobody had ever uh, really kept track of until he came along. Um, you're kind of known as the red flag guy on uh, on Twitter slash yep. X and uh, on on your YouTube channel as well. You're the one that uh, you know is on it every time that there's a red flag or knows the stats and the history behind uh, how common they are when we go from track to track and all that stuff. How did red flags kind of become your specialty when it comes to stats and analytics? Here's the thing about red flags. I'll tell you this much. I uh, it and it, it struck an annoying nerve in 2004 with Dover. When he had those two red flags, I was like, "What is going on?" That's where I think that was the first words I questioned officiating and all of that stuff because it was a disaster leading up to those two red flags at Dover. They had like 20 laps of cautions over what happened with Ryan Newman hitting the pit wall, where they had to figure out the lot who's on the lead lap, who's the lap down. I was already I was annoyed. I was already annoyed because Jeff Gordon was involved in a meaningless in a wreck that should have not happened. I I don't really look back at what happened before the red flag because I knew Gordon was out, so I was like mine checked off at that point. Then you had two red flags, and then realizing that Casey Kane they didn't clean up the oil in the first from the first red flag, and Casey Kane had that race in the bag, and nope, incompetence led to a red flag. So I've always been annoyed of them, but fast forward to 2017, I've been get I've been noticing. I think it was the brickyard where I was wondering. I've never really seen a NASCAR race there were three red flags or pushing on four. Then our then Talladega happened. There were three red flags there where there was only like eight cars left in the running, and I think that's how Greg Galvin got his first top ten in that 23 car. Right. I decided, you know what? At the end of the year, I'm gonna keep track. I'm gonna check how many red flags there were in 2017 because it must be a season record. Regular, not counting the exhibition races, it was with 20. 
2015 has 17 in the regular season and then three exhibitions, so it equals to 20. Then I said, you know, I'm going to do 2017. No, it was before the 2017. I decided, let me do 2001, because I remember 01 having a couple of red flags, that there was only like five or six. Then it built on and on to where I did every year up from 1990 to the present day. The pandemic year happened. We decided, ah, oh, let's go, let's go, let's go break the record. Let's have 22 red flags, 23 red flags. And that was a dreadful year. Even saying 2020 being a dreadful year is a severe understatement. The only ones that I can imagine that had a good 2020 is the ones that were able to do stuff in 2020 that weren't necessarily fully affected long term. And I don't really want to dive into much into 2020 other than it was just a disaster and doing a couple Arca West races pretty much saved my career in life. Let's just go with that. But back to the red flag thing. After 2017, I decided, you know, let me track it. And then it kind of slowly caught on with YouTube. But even as but I realized that it was at the point where the YouTubers were starting to grow. You had your you had those those five particular YouTubers that started the torpedo to no not torpedo, th rocket their way to the top uh, on the NASCAR landscape. There's been a few others since then. Some tactics are far better than others. Some quality, some of their opinions and qualities are eh, compared to most. But they people were starting to put me in a box to where. I'll do Xfinity, do the truck series. The only reason why I don't do Xfinity, the only reason why I don't do truck video compilations, except for the truck series races at Daytona, you gotta look back to two as far back as recent as for as you gotta go back to two thousand. There or even in the late ninety, there were races that were never te that were televised, they were abandoned. So I like to call it abandoned races, like were. It defeats the purpose of every red flag because the per the go when you think of every, you think of all of them. There were times that I forgot a, a one or two red flags. Two thousand and seven comes to mind, and I fix it and all of that to where it's updated. And then as time went on, the viewerships were not good, especially the nineties ones, because I don't know why it's like the nineties was arguably. One of the the beginning of the boom period for NASCAR. Yet yeah, the numbers don't show it, but uh, YouTube and algorithms and my war with them is is a tale all this time. But I just generally got tired of that red flag. Then I started doing the graphic series that didn't really go too well at from time to time. That and then I just slowly my YouTube uh, doing this YouTube thing just wane horrendously that I wanted nothing to do with. I took like half a year off a year ago because the monetary rights were unjustifiably taken away. Yet there's other YouTubers that do bare minimum that just recycle, literally recycle videos, topics, yeah. compilations. They get they get no punishment. Mine, I get punished, cannot and get harassed by it. I remember that you that the spam bots, the harassment bots coming in. And you made a really good video about it because it's like, what are we doing? Like, well, what are we doing? I still get them from time to time, especially yeah. it's the same ones like 2009. Nope. It's like, don't tell me that. Okay. If you're going to tell me it's no longer monetized, then reinstate me monetation wise then. Because I've not been a part of the monetization in a year. Quote unquote, because. My content is not original. Get out of here. And I and by that point I was doing the NASCAR Thunder videos, like the Easter eggs, all those other gems. Because like, why not? I mean, wrestling video games like WWE 2K, there's a lot of videos about Easter eggs, did you know and all that. Like, I wanted to do something that and then after a while, so you know, this year I was like, you know what? Do what Seth does with his stats on certain things. Do what Trey Ryan does with percentiles and all of that, average finishes and all that. Do that with red. I said, you know, I'll do this with red flags because I did like a newsletter for like Patreon that didn't work out because I got burnt out again. It's a love hate. Red flags is a love hate relationship sometimes to where 
if there's a red flag, it's like, come on, man. More often than that, it's like, really? For that? Really? Over grass? Really? Like, they're all on the apron. What are we doing? Like, this year's Day Tunnel Fire, they were all on the apron. Somebody said, oh, it's because of the mud and all that. It's like, dude, they're all on the apron. There's been a several big ones at Daytona where they didn't red flag it, and all the cars will wad them up in the apron, i.e. 1999. That one wasn't red. The most amusing thing is, it's like, the cost of red flags, there, some of them are ridiculous, silly, and outright stupid. Like, Mark, like, Talladega 2002, you think the red flag was out for the big one. No. There was one for Mark Martin's car being at a complete dead stop. And the only reason why it went red, because it fell before the five lap window where you had that red flag limit, which I still stand where I feel like IndyCar should implement a last red flag lap because stuff like the 2023 Indy 500 should never happen. I was I was just going to bring that up at some point uh, during this conversation. I wanted to get your thoughts on how that race ended because I know it divided a lot of the fan base. I was done. I was annoyed. I was peeved. I wanted it over. The red flags were happening. I was thinking, get this race over with. I am done. One hour. It was the longest 90 minutes for an, and the, that was, what was it? The longest 20 laps ever. I think it took like an hour and a half to complete 20 laps or something or 30. It's like, we had a 1997 all over again, minus the bad officiating. And fortunately, nobody got killed. And it was wild. It was a wild last lap. I don't, but I'm glad they put a rule to prevent that because one bad move, blindside, we'd be talking about a driver dead, more than likely. You, I mean, you saw with 2020 with Spencer Piggott, it basically it, it torpedoed his career. Even that with that horrific crash, your one shot sometimes it could end your career, could end your opportunity to do anything. Well, Piggott, it was, it was not necessarily his own fault, it's just a freak of nature. But it's like what Steve Young said when he retired that it's not, it's like the passion is there, but not enough for the stakes. How about your, how much of the stakes you really want to put that will be from life from life to from death? I was happy to New Garden won, but I was just glad that race was done. Between that, and then also just the fact that my photos did not turn out as well as I would have liked. The post-race stuff turned out a lot better, but did not like how that race ended. It was a wild finish, but it did not like how it ended. They should have just... I understand. It's like what happened with Jimmy Johnson. It's like, oh, this is going to become the norm. It's like, no, 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 no. And that's why Melbourne, I was not happy about Melbourne for Formula One. It's like, why do we want to... Get that? Why do we want to jeopardize more cars? Why do we want to? Je I get it for the fans. I get that, but from from an integrity standpoint, as a as a writer, as a journalist, as a photographer, even a little bit of the fan note, or just common sense, what are we doing? They need to put a, la a red flag lap. They need to. If it ends under caution to advertise, so be it. It is what it is. It's just freaking nature happened. Yeah, it's like, yeah, the race should have been done the moment Benjamin Peterson and Ed Carpenter were in that wreck. It should have been game over. Marcus Erickson would have won the 500, and that's that. Good for New Garden. Good for him. But Common Sense says they should have just ended it under yellow. Because 2023 mirrored 1997 in so many ways. It's not even funny. Yeah, I, I, I certainly... I agree with that. And again, I think it was part of it was the fact that there were three of them. Like I think Kirkwood's accident warranted. I mean, that was a situation that I think, you know, understandably the red flag comes out for that. And then uh, the, the second incident, I think that, you know, again, it was much like Jimmy Johnson's crash a year before. Um, you know, I, I suppose maybe that I'd be willing to make that a trade off for, you know, not going into overtime. Like if you're going to try to get a green flag finish that that's your one attempt. You know, but then they crash again on the restart, and that's, I mean, that that was the one that was most egregious to me. Um, and again, you know, take nothing away from Joseph Newgarden. Uh, you know, everybody has the same rules to play by, and he executed uh, the restart. But again, the fact that, you know, I've said this before on the grid shows and everything, the fact that they did get a green flag finish out of that, I think is absolutely 
miraculous, um, you know, because, I mean, to not even give them a full warm-up lap coming out of the pits, I mean, we we are very fortunate that, uh, you know, something much worse didn't occur on that restart and uh, that they ended up getting away with it. So I hope that they've learned their lesson and uh, they don't they don't try it again this year. I hope not. I hope not. And I hope it doesn't come out, come down to that because this is a big one. This is a big race for not just in any car, but in racing in general, because you have Kyle Larson going for the double. The 1,100 miles that have not been done since Kurt Busch. And as far as going all 1,100 miles, that hasn't been done since, 20, since Tony Stewart. The full, the full, the full bore. Like, finish the race, be on the lead lap, and get a good run. And part of me thinks that when you look back at 2001, how Tony was really strong, who's to say he would have won the 600 had he not missed the driver's meeting? But in fairness, he did spot a lap once, so you never know with those sort of, with those deals. But they're going to bring some more eyeballs. Uh, the NASCAR folks will want to tune into IndyCar and see it. Because if, it, if it's a, a slam dunk, a massive success, then we can kind of move on for 2023 a little bit. Never again. I don't want to see what happened in 2023 again at all costs. You can find ways to make daring moves. If you have it, great. If you don't, you don't. But sometimes when you serpentine and all that, it can get pretty wild and chaotic. You can save it on the backstretch. Don't do it like as you're coming at the pit road because you never know what could have happened. Yeah. Let's move on. I know that you're uh, obviously... Um you know, passionate about number fonts and uh, certain aspects uh, of the yeah. broadcast as well. I know that that's a, a hot topic, especially this year oh. with uh, the new rights deal coming in uh, next year in 2025. Um, so how, tell me how that kind of got started, because I, I I feel the same way. I feel like there's no excuse uh, nowadays, especially with the technology that we have, uh, not to have the correct numbers and colors and fonts and everything on the leaderboards and the graphics and things like that. When I did that NASCAR graphics series for a couple of years, I still have yet to do ESPN, both runs, ABC, separate run, and CBS. I might as well have to do an update, but goodness for NBC, they really haven't updated it since 2019, to be honest with you. It makes me wonder if that Indy 500, we're going to see a different graphic overhaul. I don't know. You never know. But that's another thing when I was a kid that I was also annoyed is just seeing like, the field fillers, or even though, like, this pretty much where most of the common cons issue was, like, the field fillers didn't have the right number of us. You had your generic funds that is used for the Bush series. And there were some, like, the, the year prior, they had it. And then the following year, they don't. They all had to change the color and all that. Sometimes they kept it, like Robert Presley's 77 font. They, did, they kept it the following year with Dave Blaney took over the Jasper car, then they had a different font, just stuff like that, or even Casey Atwood, still the seven font from the year before, but I'm like, kind of willing to forgive them for it, it's like, it's kind of silly, but as time went by, like NBC and TNT, the 04 through 06 in particular, what are we doing? I'm like, come on now. And Fox were very consistent on it, but you didn't really see it on the ticker or any of that. But like Fox had, yeah, there was 01 or 02. It took a while for them to include it, but they were on it. Then 2011 onwards is kind of where it kind of got really ridiculous and redundant, where it's just, I'm about aesthetics. I want a clean graphics to be clean, simple. And at least be caught, have the decency to update, like the 15 font with Clint Boyer in 2016. Why is it with the five hour energy car, you kept the Michael Walter Racing font, but when Boyer has a different sponsor, you have the actual correct number front from A. Scott Motorsports? And I, and I, somebody told me it's like the deadlines and all that. I get that. And I look back at like a year or two ago, it's like, why do I have this? Backhanded, backhanded comment pin. It's like no, unpin it. It's like I can. It's like stuff like that shouldn't matter. Yeah, it's like it's a part of the visual presentation. Sometimes it doesn't matter to some people, but it does for me and a lot of people. And as years went by, I feel like graphics are becoming an overkill. Like Fox is specifically. Do we really need to see a heads-up display along with the a giant a 
a giant ass graphic that shows the cruise ship quotes. It's like Formula One keeps it like this, like small, like this. NASCAR is like, let's take up this. Look, look, look at my screen right now. If you may see it, look at my hands. Cruise ship quotes. Ticker on right over here. Ticker over here where my finger is, right there. Heads up display over here. There's a way to do it, but at least the number of bots have been getting better. Unless if it's Arca, then it's just uh, it's just like, like come on, guys. I can clearly tell you just you magic wand and you crop you got rid of the background from a NR two thousand and three render, and because I I know that firsthand because I. Try number fonts. I put it like a little box, like a graphic number fonts, like do fantasy racing stuff. Like I have my own spare time, like the NR2003, like Xfinity to trucks, like an obscure back marker or a field, a field filler or a top team where I couldn't find a number font on Google or through the NR2003 utilities and all that stuff. There's a lot of them out there. I had to literally get a truck or like a, even a real life photo crop it and hope it looks good most of them did not look good and that when i saw like fox were doing that for their arca covers like come on guys i hey a, a for at least they tried but <laughs> i can still tell it's not necessarily a clean work on the graphics but that's where it started 2004 like 06 that got better where it's only like one or two cars but there were times where like seven to ten cars did not have one. It's like, come on now, come on, either have all of them or none at all. Yeah, well, I remember when Fox went to the uh, ticker on the or leaderboard on the side of the uh, screen rather than uh, the the uh, the horizontal one going across the the top, uh, like the more conventional one, uh, which I guess is kind of an advent of going to widescreen uh, sixteen by nine. Yeah. television screens there's more space on the left side you know you can show more cars at a time but even then um it was like 2018 and it took them i think half a season at least to get the number fonts on on that leaderboard i still remember uh 2018 daytona 500 just had the generic standard fonts for, for everybody in the field and I'm thinking to myself like it's 2018 how do we not have those number fonts yet or some of the backgrounds don't blend well like the color like i think i even mentioned in my initial thoughts where when the space scheme changes, if you keep that number font, it's going to bleed over. It's not going to look good aesthetically. And then again, that's more or less Fox, that time period of Fox, that graphics were just uninspiring, dull, and boring. But at least it was like, the, when it didn't have the fonts, it was all uniform, generic yellow text, which is it's like, I, I just think I mentioned it initially, it's like, it's fine, it's whatever, but the the most offensive example is 2014 when they done away from the upper ticker it just only had like a group of three or five names like back in the day, but it ha whereas just had a gray background and black tax font it's like for the Daytona 500 and you kept it all the way to like the spring race at Texas. What are we doing? I get it. It takes time and pages and all. I get that, but NBC in 2001. They had all the number fonts. Ultimately, they did away with it with the first gen graphics, but at least they adapted and quickly changed it. Fox took them about a, a, a third of their run in 2014 to add the number fonts from the 14 through 17 graphics. And then that's when it looked a little bit better. It's just like, keep it consistent. And. Don't get me started with the driven cartoons. Don't get me started with those. Oh, yeah. I Okay, yeah. for those who are wondering, why am I saying driven cartoons? I say it on Twitter or slash X every now and then. Go look at the video game driven. Yes, it exists. Driven the video game. Look at the driver menu. And tell me, tell me they were not inspired. Fox were not inspired by that. Because when I look at Denny Hamlin or Kyle Busch with his abs that he doesn't clearly have, of course, that's what it reminded me. It's like we're oh. going. What are we doing? <sighs> I'm gonna yes. have to. Do, I'm gonna have to do that because I have the. Uh, I have both the PS2 and the GameCube versions of that. Uh, that driven game, but I've, I've maybe played them once, if if that. So I'm gonna have to go back and uh, dust off my right. PS2 and pop that disc in there and uh, try to see the comparison that you're talking about. There's an Easter egg in the story mode, but I would suggest 
find the cheat final go online and go find the cheat codes to unlock everything because it's not worth the time to grind it out. It is not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I hope it's better than the movie at least, although I I've got a feeling that's a, a low bar that you gotta cross over. This is driven is a guilty pleasure film. It's not great. It's a guilty pleasure. There's some yeah. And there's some good gems in there. Like I love the fact that it's on the card, card, the card, the that time period where there was the golden. It was like the tail end of the golden years of liveries in that era because, who, especially the the tobacco era. I never consume it. Never will consume it. But they made some of the best darn liveries out there slash paint scheme. They they live. They really did. And it's missing. And this is why I'm partial with the Errol McLarens because bring some of that old golden days back, especially Rossi's car this year. Sure. But, yeah. yeah. And the reason why I'm passionate and get fired up about it because somebody's got to bring it up. Like what Red Flag, going back to Red Flags, somebody's got to bring it up. And oh, you have to think about Red Flags. There's sometimes, like, NASCAR has the official result. They keep track of the red flags and the times. When it comes to range-shorted events and all that, they don't count it. The timing, for some reason. It doesn't really matter at the end, but they don't, sometimes they don't count it as an official red flag. But to me, here's the thing. If the race ends under, if the, if it's under a red flag, and that's what they call the race, it's a red flag. It counts. But, very rarely we see this now. If if it's say if it's pouring and they decide we're not gonna red flag but we're gonna call it wave the white flag, that is still under yellow conditions. It's important to know that. And sometimes, like the Memorial Day reflection, there are years that it counts. They count it in the official results book. Sometimes they don't count it, and sometimes they don't say withdraw the yellow, display the red. When I don't hear the words withdraw the yellow, display the red, when it comes to that. The 600 is, and if it doesn't show on the on the results, red flag time, it's not counted as a red flag in my book. Is there's a lot, one of these days I will do a video, what constitutes a red flag, what does it, because it's important to know how I've learned they've done it from research and how I track them. One of these days I will, maybe when we get that are combined total since 1990, 500 red flags. Unless I decide, you know, let me track 1986, 87, 88, 89. I'm not going any further than that because, and here's the reason why, 1990 is the time window, the limit window, the starting point. Because, and it's, the 80s was kind of odd because some races were not televised. Some races were condensed into like 30-minute highlights from like Ms. Lou or SETN. There's no telling there was there's how am I supposed to know if they had a red flag or not when it's condensed to 30 minute highlights. The newspaper may say it, but there may not be footage to find. And I want to show footage rather than just text and all of that. Now I, pre- I highly appreciate Seth finding like even like news articles that say all oh, the red flags like good for the local papers. I'm happy they bring this up. But tracking entry from 1948 through 1989. That's going to be a grind in the short to find newspapers that even cover those races back then. Yeah, well, I, I appreciate the work that you do because I think it's it's certainly a curiosity uh, stat that a lot of people um, might not think to follow, but I think it's important that uh, somebody keeps track of it, like you were saying. Totally. Um, yeah. And it's not the only... Go sorry ahead. about this. Sure. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. It's not the only stat that I keep track now. I also, I'm also i now tracking the who's going to get 30 top 10s because... Lo and behold, right. Jeff Gordon in 07. I remember that. Lo and behold, nobody has done it since. Kevin Harvick and Kyle Bush came close in that big three year where it was him, Truex, and Harvick, only for Joey Logano. Yep. Championship away. <laughs> 20, they were, they were so close, but I feel like I, I, that's going to be a fun one to try because it's amazing how Jeff Gordon has 30 top 10s. Championship numbers any other year, still finished second. In fairness, Johnson got 10 wins, but it's still baffling to me to this very day. You probably have you have one of the greatest seasons in the modern era and no title to show for. 
Yeah. Well, and, and the reason I remember that was because that was the first season I watched full time. I watched a couple of races towards the end of 06, but um, I, I remember Jeff Gordon, uh, you know, being so consistent that year and, you know, winning a handful of races on his own. But, you know, that was obviously in the middle of Jimmy Johnson's five consecutive titles where, you know, he had the chase nailed down. And uh, yep. I remember, Super I remember Gordon up. winning Talladega and Charlotte back to back and then Johnson racking, r- running off uh four of his own. And then uh, by Homestead, he basically just kind of had to make sure Gordon didn't finish too far ahead of him and survive. And uh, that's exactly what happened. And he went for championship. Yep. Still haunts me to this day. Uh, one of these days I might do a series like the greatest season that never was. It's like a series like you have Gordon 07, the big three in 2018, Montoya 2015. Alex, There's already one of Alexander Rossi by Krista Hardy about his 2018 season, how any other season, that's championship numbers, but Dixon prevailed. Well, again, Twice. similar situation. One of the all-time greats. You just happen to run into that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you obviously touched on it uh, at the start, but I know, uh, again, anybody who follows you on social media knows you're a diehard Seattle sports fan. Um, I want to go back to this past NFL season. I think really kind of the okay. moment that I recognized that the Eagles were the worst 10-1 uh, and one team in the history of the National Football League. Um, Drew Locke came into the game for your Seattle Seahawks and ran off the, the craziest, what was it, 92-yard game-winning drive. I mean, one of the craziest things I've ever seen. And of course, my Eagles were on the wrong end of it. But uh, how, how do you feel about the state of of Seahawks football? Uh, you know, obviously that being one of the highlights of the last several years in the post-Russell uh, Wilson era. Uh, how how Drew Locke did that, I felt so bad for, for y'all. I felt so bad, whether it's warranted or not. Don't yeah, don't because we deserved it. I mean, it was again. I, don't I know just how... I was gobsmacked that it was Drew Locke because when I found out it was gonna be Drew Locke, I was like, well, because I had I had minimal expectations for Drew Locke, and then he just, he made himself into a Seattle legend that that night, and it's like on Monday night, it's like, oh, thank God, because what, it seems like when it's Seahawks, when it's a Joe Buck and Troy Aikman game. It, and it fuels my annoyance so much when they're so critical, justified or not. It's like, it's like, job, Joe, job, Troy. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. You might be right, but I don't want to hear it. And then the fact that Drew Locke was able to put the, the, the run of his life, the drive of his life, and then, then love with the pick. It's like, it's something about, I made a racing reference right away. It's something about Venerini numbers and the word, and the last name love clicking. Well, obviously the, the Seahawks is number 20. If I remember correctly. Yeah. Number 20. And obviously the 20 is a Venerini number. Sure. That yeah. I believe Jesse love drove a race or two in that 20. I can't remember. It's been, a, even if it's a few years ago, it's still kind of a blur that time period when it comes to one of the championship re- in it last year. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you might be right. Jeez, it's, geez, I had to pause. Right, yeah. like, I had to pause for a second because it was that championship where he had to win or else. It's like and he had literally no true, genuine competition. But back to Seattle, sure. Just, uh, Drew Lock, I was like, "Yep, you won me over. You won me over." And then he goes to the Giants, and it's like, "Well, I hope he doesn't get injured in that field." And that's that. Yeah. I am cautiously optimistic about this season. Pete Carroll pretty much was sent to the door. Fortunately, he wasn't fired. He basically kind of had to resign, which I was thinking, well, if they don't make the plays, let him gracefully resign if needed. And they always hear, oh, he's going to do one more year. It's like, Pete, with all due respect, you'll always be my coach. Dating back to USC, you'll always be the coach for me. No matter what. But it was time. It was time. Yeah. He had he still has the fired up energy. And then and then it was the day, it was that week where I think it was like a few hours later, Saban retired. Then the next day or two, it was Belichick who got let parted ways. And then the U dub head coach decided to be a sellout and go to Alabama. I'm still sore about that national championship game and the, how DeBoer left. In hindsight, I can I get it. I get it. It's the most coveted head coaching position available. 
But the way you went up, the way DeBoer went about it, didn't sit well with the Husky fans. And here, I'll make a disclaimer. If it was the Cougars, watch say Cougars that were doing well in that same shoes, I would have felt the same way. Because I'm I'm fairly neutral. I just where I lean towards whoever's doing better the year. So in this case, it was the Huskies. And also being in a half hour, 40 minutes away from Seattle, I kind of lure slowly became more Huskies over Cougars. But Cougars are still, if the Cougars have similar success, like last year's Huskies, I'll be on board for them. And I wish them absolutely the best, especially now how them and Oregon State got screwed over with the Tupac, the now Tupac conference. But after all of that, Carol is like, then I was thinking, no. And then Chip, then all the, who's going to be our head coach? I said it like, do we want Bill Belichick? Nobody wanted Belichick. Yeah. I get, nobody wanted it. It was like, wow, everybody, they were a unanimous nose. Okay. And look at Belichick. We're, no coaching job. He has none. He's going to be in some seminar for the University of Washington. Good, good for him. But to say just two, three bad seasons without Brady, you're out of the NFL. And Carroll is still involved, but Chip Kelly, no. Jim Harbaugh, mixed opinions. Mixed opinions with him. Fortunately, he had to go to the Chargers with Mr. Nike, you, Justin Herbert. Then McDonald kind of picked up some steam, and then it was like, you know, he's young. For speaking of young and ages and all of that, we're not going to, we won't discuss about this in this subject matter when it comes to age. Let's talk about age situation where it's more civil. Age, like NFL head coach, it's like all of a sudden the people that are 60s or 70s are retiring or got let go. That leaves Andy Reid left. And then people are saying, oh, Andy Reid may retire. It's like, nope, Andy Reid's still around. So then Mike Tomlin's not one of the longest tenures. It's like, what? Jeez. Talk about in the swoop, the Pete Carroll effect. I'm going to call him the Pete Carroll effect because he was the first to go. And then McDonald was our head coach, like Baltimore Ravens. And here, and this is why I'm kind of thankful for the Chiefs. I know a lot of people don't care about the Chiefs. A lot of people hate them. I understand. I get it. I totally understand. And I felt so bad for the Niners. It, it, it pains me to say that. I felt bad for the Niners because one of my closest friends is a Niners fan who's been a huge mentor. You know who he is. But I'm, I'm, a, I'm not going to mention his name, but he's a big Niners fan. I owe the world for him, career-wise and everything. I felt bad for him. I felt bad for my be- one of my other bestest friends, his boyfriends, who is a Niners fan, which, come on now. I felt bad for them, especially her boyfriend. I felt for I felt that I first finally met at, on the at Clash Weekend in L.A., which, oh boy, that, that was an interesting weekend with the, with the one the one-night show. My youngest brother, I felt bad for him. But in turn, the only thing I'm thankful for the Chiefs is they gave us they gave us a reason to go for McDonald after they beat the Ravens. And now the Ravens are looking like they're going to be OP this season, and the Seahawks is just cleaning house. Yeah, I... Uh, That's again, why I'm cautiously yeah. optimistic. Sure, yeah. I, I mean, I feel like I feel like I should kind of like the Chiefs because Andy Reid is there, and, you know, it obviously... We love Jason Kelsey in in Philadelphia, and I know Jason and, and Travis have a, a a really deep bond and a great relationship, and I think that's beautiful. Um, but I just and I'm sure Kansas City fans would turn around and say the same thing about Jason, but I feel like Travis is a little bit more annoying than his brother, and uh, you know, and it, it it has nothing to even do with the whole Taylor Swift thing. Like I know people have very polarizing opinions on that. I just I I feel like we're at the point now where there are more people mad about the people mad about Taylor Swift than there are actually people irrationally mad about Taylor Swift and everything. But I, I, I feel like my reasons for my, my disdain for the Kansas city chiefs are, are strictly football related. Cause I, I can't stand the fact that, I mean, I was happy for Andy Reid when he got his first and you know, whatever he got his revenge. Did he ever got, getting did he the ever second, got that but he couldn't get us meal? over the hump and then he goes somewhere else and he gets three. I mean, yeah, good for him, I guess. I just, I don't understand why, you know, I, I, ha- I have to be, Super happy for him, uh, you know that that he couldn't do it with us. But 
yeah, I don't know. I'm I feel like I'm I'm quite chiefed out. You know, I don't I'm I'm a little nervous that we're starting to see another uh you know dynasty forming in the AFC. I'd like to see a little bit more parody next year, but yeah, Ravens uh, Ravens could be there, but they just I don't know what the it looked like at one point it seems we're go like okay, Ravens got this because they were pound for pound the best team. They obliterated San Francisco on prime time for crying out loud. I was hoping for that rematch. But as a Seahawks fan, I was also hoping for Detroit for a Detroit Super Bowl. So then it's like, especially if it was Chiefs Lions, we like Eminem, Taylor Swift. Oh boy. Imagine the the match of the fan base for that one if that was Detroit, Kansas. Oh boy, we would not hear the end of it. Not one bit. But Lions got a lion. At least they finally won playoff games in our lifetimes because the last time they won, none of us were born yet. Yeah. But when it comes to the whole thing with Taylor and all that, if anything, she brings numbers not just for the, for the female demographic, which is which is it's still amusing that it's like when you think of football, that's like one of the sports that females love. Sometimes baseball and basketball, but we're kind of seeing that. Like the Taylor Swift effect with football with women, but also seeing that with women's basketball, which is which honestly it's great to see. And I yeah. feel and people are saying it. Women's the women's tournament is the more important, the more intriguing one of than the men's. And that's yeah. because you know, I don't and, know. Yeah, I, mean, I was I was gonna save that for uh, I, w- I want to ask you about some of the other Seattle teams as well, but uh since you brought it up, I I can tell you I I can name so many more women's players off the top of my head. Uh, over the last couple of years than been on the men's side. I mean, I know Brownie, obviously, you know, and I think uh, Robin's son is is there at USC as well. And, uh, you know, Zach Eady, obviously at Purdue, but like with, with the men's games, with so many players being one and dones, I just feel like the turnover year to year makes it a lot more difficult to get invested in, in teams and rosters. Whereas, you know, on the women's side, I mean, you see there's, there's so much talent that, is going into the draft this year from WNBA or could be going into the draft. Maybe it's going to take one more year. Like I know Paige Becker's obviously had to mm-hmm. red shirt a year. So she's coming back to UConn, which I think is, is going to be good for her. But I mean, the, the Caitlin Clark hype is, uh, is absolutely off the charts. And I think uh, deservedly so. Um, yeah. So I think it's a very, it's a, it's a big opportunity for uh, the WNBA especially, but I think women's basketball as a whole is certainly trending up. And uh, I think, you know, there's, there's a multitude of reasons for it, but I think, you know, finding their identity and marketing uh, their star players is certainly a big part of that. Yeah, and that's why it's like, as not good as the Storm were last year. They were bottom three all year, the Seattle Storm, because remember, it was the first year after Sue Bird retired. Right. But we still had, like, Jewel Lloyd, but you also have, like, instances where the, the, the void was there, obviously. And I was thinking, oh, okay, we might get Clark, we might get Reese, we might get... Cardoso, we might get so 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 and so. We would be okay. Then we traded our spot to the uh, to the Sparks, but we did got a couple people on our team that are that is going to make us look a little bit better. But as soon as we gave up, that's why I was like, "Well, we're out of the sweet stakes." Or better yet, we were not the number one draft pick because draft lottery, <laughs> draft lottery. I tell you what, they went to I'm Indiana. Yeah, it's like they went to Indiana. It's like okay, it's like well, we already know who's gonna. We already know where. That's who's what they're gonna go with. It's like you don't pass up Caitlin Clark. It's and then as soon as she announced that this is it, well, it's like well, Indiana's got good. And then and the thing is, in some way, it's kind of like how would you? What I don't know what the word is, fitting in a way, because. There's been a couple times through Hypey that Caitlin Clark has appeared at the IndyCar Iowa race. Sure, yeah. Can you imagine, say, 2024 Indy 500, barring, I don't know what the Indiana Fever schedule is during the month of May, especially a 500 weekend. Can you imagine, doesn't have to be this year, it could be next year. But I'm talking about this year particularly. Imagine an Indy 500 where you have, like, Caitlin Clark, like, I don't know... Waving the green flag or something, and then Kyle Larson in it, or it's like it kind of it's kind of like fitting in a way where we've seen her a couple times in IndyCar and in the IndyCar races, and she's gonna go to the town that is synonymous to IndyCar, the state. So I was IndyCar oh. auto racing, so it's like it's like this is like the 
perfect place. And then you have Aaliyah Boston over there. I think in the end, it's going to make some noise that people think. And, that, and, here, and here's the thing about South Carolina. With the, the aforementioned Aaliyah Boston. People were thinking, okay, how will they do without Aaliyah? Because obviously, you had Cardoso as well. Which, I think at one point, the Storm were project They had Cardoso projected to go with Seattle before we gave up the spot. South Carolina looked, uh, some, all intents and purposes, they have looked better than ever. This fight having like a generational, uh, a, a, a super, a transition, uh, like a generational talent go to the W2 to the pros. They've done enormously well to where there's like seven or eight schools. Put them in an, under a blanket, and you could probably go no wrong with, you, with one of those eight teams. Like, you have. USC is going to be strong next for the next couple of years because of Juju Watkins. She's just a freshman. Yeah. So it'd be curious to see how she evolves and how much momentum will she carry the torch because it's going to be a huge torch to pass on. Because once Paige goes to the pros and after next year, that's going to be the big question mark for college sports because the they we're at that boom period. The, the ratings are skyrocketing. The tennis figures has gone up. I will. I am looking forward to see how it will transition to the WNBA to where maybe we'll see like your Sabrina's, your Kelsey Plums, your AJ Wilson. Maybe see a little bit more revenue coming their way because it makes the sport better. It makes everybody in the league better because that's been the thing about the WNBA, the pay system, like to where several players spend their off, pretty much play ball all year long especially some go to Europe to play ball, win championships and all of that. Because sometimes, if I remember correctly, correct me if I'm wrong, do sometimes in Europe they pay more than here with women's basketball? I, I wouldn't be surprised. I don't know for sure. Um, but I think that there's certainly, and, and I think this is, you know, not to get, I'm sure people are going to politicize it just from bringing the, the name up, but, you know, that's that's why Brittany Griner was was over in Russia, you know, was was trying to play, you know, basketball during the offseason just because the, the the whole pay situation obviously is not what it is uh, in the NBA. And, uh, you know, the leagues over there, you no know, professional leagues, you know, I think pay substantially more. Um, I don't know if it's the same over in like Euro League uh, play or, or whatever. But, yeah, I mean, there's definitely that that's why women's basketball is kind of year round is because there's it needs to be to be to make sure the players are being compensated for, for their play. Yeah. Uh, uh, even the top players have been vocal about it as well. When you have the top players even being vocal, it, it's, it's a music scene. So I'm curious how the next five years is going to look, the landscape of women's basketball, because you mentioned it with the men's, with the one and done, some of them not living up to par, or you don't really hear about it. Because when you look at the NBA, aside from... Wimby, yeah, but, oh, ugh, I cannot pronounce it. Wemby from the Spurs. Sure, yeah. Has there been any other rookies that we people have kind of talked about? You hear more about Wemby, and the same thing with the NHL as well with Connor Bedard. They're they're standing out at teams that are at the very bottom that are that are used to they're accustomed to championships, like the Spurs and Chicago Blackhawks, like. You have that, but aside from that, who else do you have? Because if you look at Bronny, we don't know if he's going to be one and done, but then again, they didn't even make the tournament. Yeah, I, I, hope, he's not. Tournament. I hope he not. I hope he comes back and uh, has another year. I mean, the fact that he's, I mean, even alive, you know, is is after his health scare this, this past summer is certainly uh, great to see and uh, great to see him back on the court. But I think that really kind of, I mean, it, took away really his entire summer being able to train with with usc and get ready for the season so i i know lebron has the dream to to play with his son and uh you know i, I think that would be an, a remarkable achievement for both of them but i think you know for for Bronny's sake and his career going forward i think he, he would certainly benefit much more from another year of college and trying to rush uh you know the pros yeah. and maybe being a late second round pick at best just to be able to say that they did it and and play together but yeah, yeah it was certainly, I think, it's an interesting time for college basketball for sure on, on both the men's and the women's side. It's going to be interesting to see how it plays out over the next few years. Yeah, it's just they got to – I'd be wise if you stay because if, you got the NIL too. So 
if revenue is a little bit of a factor, stick around one more year and then see and truly shine in year two. So that way your stock value increases. And as for LeBron, I'll do another year. <laughs> yeah. Which I think is like whatever happens to the Lakers, so be it. But I guess that's a whole different drama when it comes to LeBron and the Lakers and all that to where. What okay here 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 you're speaking of LeBron and Lakers here's here's a question I will impose. What do you make of the fact that you see some teams like honor mid in season tournament championships or even wild card berths? Because I know the Mariners decided to finally add a wild card banner after we going twenty one years without the playoffs. How do you view this kind of things? Yeah, I I don't know. I see both sides of it. I know uh I, I, that Kobe that that Kobe Bryant clip went viral after. They hung the in-season turn- tournament banner like this. This franchise doesn't hang division banners or whatever. And I guess if you're the Lakers, then obviously, you know, you have good reason not to do that because you have yeah. so many championships uh, to begin with. But obviously, like if you're if you're a Lions, for example, like I, somebody made a meme, I think, after uh, the Rams won with Stafford, it was like th- this photoshopped banner in Ford Field, like our our longtime quarterback that we drafted won a Super Bowl after he left us. You know, it's like just so that we could have something up there. So. I mean, like for, for the, Lions, the Lions hanging a division banner, I, I definitely don't have a problem with, um, you know, and, and other teams, I think, you know, it, it really depends on the culture of the franchise. And, um, you know, yeah, I mean, like the Yankees, the the Lakers, the, the Cowboys, you know, certainly in the, in the 90s, I know, you know, the last few decades have been, uh, you know, a different story for them. But um, I think it depends on the franchise and depends on, on the fan base and how they how they view things as well. Yeah, like with the Lakers, like the Kobe thing. Yeah, and, and, and I think it's yeah. more inv- it's like, and when you look how this they've been after the tournament, it is a head scratcher because, like, oh, you won the inaugural in season tournament, but you basically did nothing since. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be interesting. I don't know. Yeah, it's like, so. I think it's like, I don't know if people are saying it's like, oh, that's what you get for putting it. It's like karma of Kobe or something. It's like, I want to read into that. It's like, just. They clicked at a certain point. Sometimes you click at a certain point. And sometimes you don't when it really matters. So it's just that's just wow. the nature of the beast. Let's stick with basketball here and uh talk about the NBA for a bit because I know uh you know you, you brought up the Seattle Storm. At least you have a, a franchise in the WNBA. I'm mm-hmm. still waiting for one here uh in Philadelphia. Um you guys have uh the Mariners, obviously. You have the uh Seattle Kraken, uh the latest expansion team in the NHL. You even have the Seattle Sounders in major league soccer you used to have the supersonics they moved to oklahoma city became a thunder uh there's talk about uh you know obviously expansion for the nba and i think seattle and las vegas pretty clearly objectively the two uh cities that make the most sense for it but i want to ask you a question because i I was actually just having this discussion with one of my housemates uh last night who's a thunder fan um the Philadelphia 76ers were once the Syracuse Nationals and they won a championship and then they've won two more since they moved to Philadelphia and became the Sixers. Um, and if you ask anybody here in Philadelphia, they'll tell you that, you know, the 76ers and the history that they've established uh, with their team, they're three-time NBA champions, even though one came in a completely different city with a completely different name. Do you view the the Thunder as being able to claim that championship in 79 as a Seattle sports fan, or would you say that no, you're waiting for the Sonics to come back so that you can re- kind of like the Charlotte Hornets did reacquire all those old records from the thunder. Ex- exactly. No, no, they have zero in my book. I understand that is a relocation and the relocation lineage will say otherwise, but no, as long as they don't win the NBA championship, we don't have to worry about a thing. But if they do, they can claim that one. We will not claim. We will not claim it, and I hope we don't claim it. Yeah, the banner may say otherwise. May say otherwise, but Seattle folks will never claim a Thunder championship. And honestly, when we get our team back, hopefully sooner than later, we get everything from up until 08. The Thunder can keep everything 08, 09 onwards. They have their records. We get our team back. We better get the stuff that we had into our arsenal. So that way, we still have that one championship, and the Thunder have zero instead of the technicality of one. 
And I'd imagine the Thunder fans too would have to feel the same way. It's like we have no titles, even though technically technically they do. But they, I hope they don't claim it as that we have a championship when they don't in their current lineage right now. Yeah, and and I I tend to agree with that, and I think it you know for for us in Philly it gets a little, uh, you know murky with with the history as well because the Warriors used to be in Philadelphia and you know had a, a tremendous amount of success there. Will Chamberlain obviously, uh, you know had 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 a lot of success, and then he he came back to Philadelphia with the Sixers and won a championship there uh, later in his career. Um, but you know I I think part of it is is also the fact that they not only relocated but they changed the name and the you know, colors and everything about the team is completely different. Whereas, you know, the Hornets obviously moved to New Orleans, kept the name, and then two years later, Charlotte got an expansion franchise with the Bobcats, and then the Hornets changed their name to the Pelicans, but the Bobcats could get the Hornets name back, and then they reacquire all those old records. So it's this weird situation where it's like retroactively, the team didn't exist for a couple of years. Um, Obviously, Seattle's been without a team uh, for much longer, but... um. I mean, I think you said it, you know, are, are you hopeful that, you know, in the not too distant future, you know, maybe, maybe when LeBron finally decides to retire and who knows how many years he has left, but he's talked about ownership. Do you think, you know, winning the inaugural in-season tournament in Las Vegas, you know, maybe he, you know, uses that as a foundation for a team there. And then you guys get the Sonics back. Are, are you hopeful that that's going to happen? The fact that LeBron being an owner of an NBA team for Las Vegas is because they won the tournament. I don't know. I, I I wouldn't be surprised, but I don't think it's going to be in Seattle. Because here's the thing. If we wanted any form of equity, no, I can't really say the, I can't really say anything basketball related because I was going to mention RFK, like the Fenway entities that LeBron has some small share. Sure. Yeah. A, little, a little bit of it. I was thinking, hmm, but I wouldn't be surprised if he actually gets into ownership. But how many players have we really seen it that kind of been successful? Because you see players retire, they become coaches or or some general manager and all of that stuff. There's been some, but you have your, of course, you have your, your Steve Kerr's and your Larry Bird's, and then particularly Bird, instant success. And then flame out after a while. Whereas Kerr, obviously he was good in his role, but he's no Larry Bird in the sense like an all-time great. So I'll be curious to see where an all-time great Arsenal LeBron would be. Because mind you, Michael Jordan, how many championships he's won as an owner? Zero. Exactly, yeah. Look at the Bobcats era. near as well as it did for him as a player. Yeah, look at the Bobcats era. People want to talk about the Pistons for that period of time. The Bobcats. 2011-2012. So, you know, it's just like a, it's like flipping a coin. LeBron could be good. For all we know, maybe not. You never know. Sometimes we're an all-time greater legend. It doesn't necessarily always transition to success in, in other fields. Unless your name is Jeff Gordon in the future. But, I mean... It's yeah. he, he's been kind of been an owner for like over 20 years and a quasi now more definitive role. I mean, if you really want to go there, Jeff Gordon has won 11 championships in his career, four as a driver, yeah. 11 as an owner. Yeah, well, seven as an owner and 11 total, I guess, right? Yeah, Cause Jimmy got his. Yeah, exactly. My question is, does he have in? Does he have some share of? I forget if he has some ownership on the five. I don't know. Maybe it is 12. Yeah, I don't know. I'd have to go back and look at the the owner standings and see who's who's actually listed there. But yeah, it is yeah. kind of complicated. It's as complicated as the lineage of the Hendrick Motorsports numbers, as to far as, and I'll I'll briefly say it like the current twenty four used to be the original forty eight, and so on and so forth. It's a mess and it's complicated. <laughs> Let's just leave it at that. Yeah, for sure. Um. Last thing here, and then I guess we'll uh, we'll wrap it up. Um, you know, you, you brought up the Mariners as well, and uh, you know, I think one of the, one of the things you let off with was uh, the Kraken. And uh, you know, I, I must confess, I don't follow the NHL season regular season as closely. I'll always watch the Stanley Cup playoffs because I, I love the playoff atmosphere of hockey and everything. But I know the fly my Flyers were not expected to have a good season at all, and yet they're still clinging to a playoff spot here. We'll see if they can hang on to it, but. 
Um, you know, how, how impressed have you been with, uh, you know, the, the crack in here, the first few seasons, obviously Vegas set a very high standard getting to a Stanley cup final, their inaugural year, and then winning one, uh, in whatever it was only their sixth year, I guess, uh, or seventh year last year. Yeah, um, last year. Yeah. Do you see, uh, do you see the Kraken on a long-term path to success here? Where do you, where do you view that franchise right now? I really hope so. I really hope so. They set the bar because of their bar. The NHL were kind of afraid. We're afraid. They don't want us to be like a, a be even better version of the Golden Knights. They had some restrictions. We were okay year one. Year two, it was magic. Year two was bad. Year three, we have been on a torpedo this month. It seems like beating the Golden Knights in the Winter Classic, that was our Stanley Cup. That was our Super Bowl. The fact we did it in a shout-out, beautiful. I was thinking, okay, maybe we could be a team to be destined for greatness. I still feel that way. Not right now, though. Not right now, because there's no reason to get him mauled by Buffalo right out of the gate and allow three goals in under five minutes. You replaced Joey DeCord for Philip Grubauer, who in turn also had gave up three goals. We're not in a good spot. We're literally hanging on by a thread to still be in a wild card spot. But at the end of the day, we're not the San Jose Sharks. Fair enough. And then for many years, I literally depended on if the Sharks get eliminated. Whole turkey, stop watching the playoffs. Or don't watch it at all. Like last year, it's more or less it helps that when I'm involved in camera pro broadcast production or like in-house, like the arena and all that stuff, of one of the other jobs I do, that got to see the playoff hockey and its madness behind it. And I, it's, it's a beautiful art form. And it truly is. Just kind of bumped out that Dallas beat them and they made it to the cup and, well, they got beaten by Vegas and that was that was the bummer thing about it, but there's still hope. But we still got four more seasons to equal Vegas in terms of before what when we won the cup, their first cup. But gotta worry about just winning a game. We gotta win a game. We haven't won since I think the Capitals, no, the Penguins, the Pittsburgh. Is we beat Boston twice, a top tier team in Boston. Then we beat Pittsburgh, and we've done nothing since, especially at home. And that's been kind of the theme for the majority of the year. We cannot find a way to win at home when we need to. We need that matchup from the Winter Classic to come back, and 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 of course we lost. Alex Winnenberg goes to the to the New New York Rangers, gets a goal in the seven hundred game. Seattle curse is real when it comes to sports, even for the Kraken at this point. It, it, they're getting the bug. And we got to kill the bug at some point. Well, I certainly hope all the best uh, for your sports teams. And uh, Luis, thank you again so much for uh, taking some time this evening to to come on the show. Where can people find your work and uh, what plans do you have lined up here as we continue to work through 2024? All right. Well, first of all, my website, my photography website, it's this is more locally than travel, unless you want to pay extra for the travel. Be my guess. Just good, but Louis Louis Torres Multimedia, they're obviously going to be shared in the socials. That I will definitely share the bet that it can, you can easily find it. But www dot l u i s d s and david t o r r e s dot com. That's my website where I post my works even the racing ones i do blogs about music where i track every where i talk about my the songs i like listening to most especially at the end of the year my best of galleries i also put video audio interviews over the years i do all that stuff instagram luis torres underscore multimedia and i would highly appreciate you guys follow me on instagram because I am still not recovered from my main one getting destroyed by somebody decided to be a nuisance to All Star Weekend at Texas. So if I get more followers on that, that'd be highly appreciated. Maybe people will win me over again. We'll win. We'll come back to realize. Look, I'm still here because I. Always, it's always the battle. I'm always. I'm still here. 
Twitter slash X at the LT files. This is an LT you can trust if from an initial standpoint. I've never changed know. my yeah. It, I've never changed my handler since 2009 when I opened my account when it was known as Twitter at the LT files where you'll find red flag stats. I'll probably post a GIF when Seth Edgar just and <laughs> Jacob Seelman at me when there's a red flag. I'll put a GIF of how I feel about it and then, or give the rundown. What is the, the X, Y, and Z red flags and all that. I also do top 10 songs of the month. More often than not, you'll see a higher Mora Taylor Swift song, maybe Metallica. Depends how I feel about the time of the year or the time of the month. Oh boy, April's going to be quite interesting, I'll tell you that much right now, but that's where you'll find me. And on Facebook, I only add people if I know you well enough, or the your mutual friends as people that I know. Otherwise, go at the LT Files on Facebook for the Facebook page, not my personal one, the Facebook page, where I will post my business, my business event, the business galleries that are for my photo business locally. As far as the NASCAR stuff galleries, you just have to, you, I have to know you fair enough to add you because that's just how I roll. And right. no, I don't have TikTok. And I don't know when I will have TikTok, but I don't have TikTok. Wow. I'm sorry about that. Luis, thanks again so much. And uh, hopefully I'll see you down the road sometime and uh, we can reconnect. Absolutely, Ben. Hopefully Portland, because right now it's looking like Supercross Seattle, maybe Long Beach, and definitely Portland. It's, it's all close proximity. All right. We'll keep our fingers crossed. Hopefully I'll see you then. For sure.